Welcome to our tour of the General Lewis Chesty Puller Gallery. I'm Dan Starks, the chairman and founder of the museum. I'd like to start by talking about who's General Puller and why did we name this gallery after him? General Lewis Puller, nicknamed Chesty Puller, is the most decorated Marine in United States history. He's the recipient of five Navy crosses, a silver star, Purple Heart, numerous other decorations for combat valor. He really epitomizes the Marines Marine focused on the welfare of Americans serving under him and focused on making sure that his part of the United States military accomplished all of its goals in the face of an enemy with numerical superiority. What I'm gonna do for this tour is tell you what is most important to me about the Chesty Puller Gallery. Why do we have the vignettes here that we do? What are the main messages? How do these messages really uh, support our honoring the service and sacrifice of every American and every American's family who has served the United States in a military capacity? And how do these stories help exemplify and educate next generations about the history of American freedom? What we're gonna do is first, we'll start out talking about the consequences of World War II. The first diorama here in the gallery is a consequences theater with a 17 minute movie talking about four major takeaways from World War II. After that, we'll talk about the highlights of the American experience in the Korean War. Then most of our time will be spent talking about the American experience in the Vietnam War. So first, consequences of World War II. The rallying cause of United States involvement in World War II was to vindicate the right of self-determination. Nazi Germany had imposed its will and imposed its form of government on numerous countries in Europe and in North Africa. Imperial Japan had done the same on numerous countries throughout the Asia Pacific theater. All of that was contrary to the idea that people get to choose what their government will be, who their government will be. As a result of this uh, reinforcement of the right of self-determination, a major consequence is World War II marked the beginning of the end of European colonialism. In the years that followed World War II, all of the French colonies, the British colonies, certainly Imperial Japan, the Japanese Empire and its colonies, they all disappeared all around the world. Another major takeaway from World War II was it marked the end of American isolationism. Remember, you know, approximately 4% of the global population was killed in World War II. More than another 8% of the global population was wounded. We came out of World War II saying that we can't have a World War III keeping in mind that if there was a World War III, it would now be a global war with nuclear weapons. And instead of just 12% or more of the global population dead or wounded with nuclear weapons, there might be only 12% of the global population left alive. So this was such a big deal that we resolved, no matter where around the world, we see aggressors expanding, becoming stronger, taking on more natural resources, taking over more industrial capability from other countries. Rather than let those bad actors expand and become stronger, we're gonna nip aggression in the bud. Instead of having another big war, the lesser of the evils is to have smaller wars sooner. So this lesson learned from World War II, you see, influencing the United States national security decisions even today with respect to Iraq, with respect to Afghanistan, with respect to Kuwait, and then with respect to Korea and with respect to Vietnam. Another major consequence of World War II was it marked the beginning of the Cold War. As we came toward the end of World War II, we had agreements with our major allies, including the Soviet Union, on what the new world order would be. It would be a new world dominated by every country's right of self-determination. So it was quite a shock 
to the world and certainly to the United States when World War II was over to find that the Soviet Union under the leadership of Joseph Stalin was not interested in having the world return to peace. Instead, Stalin and the Soviet Union became global aggressors standing in the shoes of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Stalin declared that there can be no peace in the world until the entire world has become socialist under his domination. So this marked the beginning of global competition between democracies championed by the United States and socialism, communism championed by the Soviet Union. The fourth major story I wanna talk about as a takeaway from World War II is really the advent of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons totally changed the dynamics of what was at stake with warfare. There was a thought early on that given that nuclear weapons now exist, there can't be any more conventional warfare because nuclear weapons will dominate the battlefield. There was also some thought that the concept of mutually assured mass destruction helped preserve peace. So those are really the main takeaways that we touch on here in our Consequences Theater. I uh, would certainly invite everybody to uh, take full advantage of the movie we have on these four stories. It lasts about 17 minutes. It's a, it's a key part of your experience here at the museum. What we're gonna do now for the rest of this tour is, first, we're gonna go into our Korean War gallery and talk about the five major phases of the Korean War. There are three major points of geography that will be critical to our discussion. The first is to appreciate that Korea borders China. The second point of geography is the proximity of Japan. The United States is occupying Japan. That's where our closest combat troops are. The third geographic feature of significance to an understanding of the Korean War is the 38th parallel. Korea became part of Japan beginning in 1910. Japan annexed Korea. So there was no Korean government from 1910 on. There was only a Japanese government controlling all of the activities of Korea itself. At the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed that both countries would send military into Korea to take the surrender of the Japanese and then provide a transition for the Korean people to self-determination. Fast forward now to 1949. The Soviet Union has taken over and subjugated a number of formerly independent countries on the eastern side of Europe. In August of 1949, the Soviet Union detonated its first atomic bomb, signaling to the world that not only was Stalin intent on global domination, but he now had nuclear weapons to help him achieve this domination. The second major event is in December of 1949, the socialist communists under Mao Zedong won the Chinese Civil War. On December 7, 1949, the nationalist Chiang Kai-shek had fled to Taiwan to hold out on the island of Taiwan. So that's the backdrop when the temporary government in the north sent its military to invade the south, crossing the 38th parallel that day, June 25th, 1950. Red armies swept down out of the north, determined to unify Korea under a communist banner by force of arms. The Republic of Korea could not defend itself against the sudden fury of the Red Assault. Death and devastation spread over a helpless people. In the old United Nations headquarters at Lake Success, United States Delegate Warren Austin made clear the full dimension of the communist attack. Whose territory is overrun by an invading army? The Republic of Korea's. Who is assisting the Republic of Korea to defend itself? the United Nations.
Who has the influence and the power to call off the invading North Korean army? The Soviet Union. Who is responsible for the bombing and bloodshed that inevitably ensued from the fact of aggression? The North Koreans and those who support them. What member of the Security Council is supporting the North Korean regime in the Security Council? The Soviet Union. The North Koreans had gone to Moscow. They'd got the blessing from Stalin to, uh, to try to take over the southern part of the Korean Peninsula and force it to come under its socialist communist government in the north. The South Korean military was not competitive and almost immediately collapsed. All of this then pointed to Truman and the Truman Doctrine. Truman had assured the world that if this kind of thing happens, we'll come in and stick up for the people whose self-determination is a threat. And Truman followed through with that assurance. Truman had to send American troops into the Korean Peninsula as fast as possible while there still were parts of South Korea under South Korean control. The only troops available were on occupation duty in Japan. The first combat troops to be on the ground and engage the Koreans were elements of the 24th Infantry Division of General Walker's 8th Army. The first regimental combat team of the 24th Infantry Division deployed in South Korea, hoping that the prestige and superiority of the American Army would be enough to deter the North Koreans from attacking Americans on the battlefield. That hope was dashed. The North Koreans see Americans deployed for combat. The North Koreans just cut right through our lines like a hot knife through butter. There were too many North Koreans with too much heavy equipment. Ammo was precious. One field artillery battalion against 40 tanks. We'd hold them off for a few hours in a blasting frontal attack. <laughs> Reds would envelop us on both flanks. Day after day, it was pull back and fight again. There were too many of them. 30 days into the Korean War, the entire Korean Peninsula has fallen to North Korea except for a small 50 by 100 mile space surrounding the only port still in South Korean and American hands, the port of Pusan. This last line of defense around the port of Pusan came to be known as the Pusan perimeter. The Korean War began only five years, just a little bit less than five years after the end of the World War II. We were the dominant military in the world. And now here, just five years later, we have not only a third world country that is standing us down, but it's only half of a third world country. When the Soviet Union and the United States both evacuated from Korea, returning Korea to the Koreans, the Soviets left behind heavy weapons available for the North Koreans to use. The United States deliberately took all of its heavy weapons, leaving only light weapons behind for the South Koreans to use. Our rationale was we did not want to provoke a civil war on the Korean Peninsula. And one way we could ensure that the South Koreans did not act as aggressors to the North is don't leave them the weapons they would need to do that. Second factor is we had over demobilized after World War II. So our military had shrunk to a shell of its former self. Most of our combat divisions were deployed in Europe, facing off against the Soviet Union along what came to be known as the Iron Curtain. The only troops we had available to rush into Korea were troops on occupation duty in Japan. The troops on occupation duty in Japan had the wrong weapons themselves. Most of the Japanese roads would be crushed by the weight of Sherman tanks, so we had only light weapons in occupation duty available for the 8th Army to bring with it when it rushed into combat in uh, Korea. The contrast between these two tanks gives you a good visual on the mismatch 
in weapons. Here on the one hand, you see an example of the Soviet World War II T-34 main battle tank with an 85 millimeter gun. And you can see the contrast between it and our US M24 Chaffee light tank with a 75 millimeter gun. And just look at the comparison between the two guns. The 85 millimeter gun is quite a bit longer, higher velocity, longer range, larger projectile. It very much outclasses the capabilities of the M24 Chaffee light tank. You can't see as quickly the difference in armor between the T-34 Russian tank and the M24 Chaffee tank, but the mismatch in armor is every bit as dramatic as the mismatch in main guns. So we had the wrong weapons and then also wrong troops. There was going to be some hard fighting ahead and these men knew it. Even while later units were still debarking, these earlier arrivals were already on their way to the front. The situation at that time was critical. Replacements were badly needed to bolster UN positions all along the hard hit line. The only combat division available that was not already deployed, that was on reserve in the United States to send to Korea was the 1st Marine Division stationed in Southern California. The good news is, 1st Marine Division was combat ready. 1st Marine Division had heavy weapons. The 1st Marine Division quickly loaded into ships and was sailing to Korea to reinforce Walker's 8th Army. The obvious uh, point of entry for the 1st Marine Division would be to land at the only deep water port in our hands, the port of Busan. The decision maker here was General MacArthur. General MacArthur was in charge of the occupation of Japan when the Korean War broke out. His uh, scope of responsibility was expanded to include responsibility for the war in Korea. MacArthur was a daring, creative senior leader. He did not want to do the obvious with the 1st Marine Division. MacArthur's alternative idea was to create a surprise amphibious combat assault behind the lines of the North Koreans. MacArthur picked the port of Incheon up near the 38th parallel for this amphibious combat assault. Incheon was geographically poorly suited for an amphibious combat assault for two reasons. The first, it had 30 foot tides so that twice every 24 hours there was no water in the harbor. Another disadvantage of Incheon is it had islands at the mouth of the harbor which, if the enemy fortified them properly, could inflict a lot of damage on any boats trying to get from deep water troop ships into the harbor of Incheon. And so for those reasons that made it seem foolhardy to try to do this assault at Incheon are exactly the reasons MacArthur chose to do it at Incheon. He said the enemy is never gonna expect us to land there because it's such a bad location. Guns of the 262 ship United Nations Armada began their point blank preliminary bombardment. At 0630, the invasion began. Because of the tidal conditions, men in this first wave could expect no supplies or reinforcements for 10 hours. You see our vignette commemorating the Marine assault at Incheon. We're specifically remembering the valor of First Marine Lieutenant Baldomero Lopez. We have a photograph taken by a famous uh, war photographer, Marguerite Higgins, of Lieutenant Lopez saying, follow me, leading his troops up this ladder, climbing over the seawall to engage the North Korean defenders. Only minutes after this famous photograph was taken, Lieutenant Baldomero Lopez was killed in action. He pulled the pin on a grenade to throw it a North Korean position. Once he pulled the pin, he was struck by automatic weapons fire in the chest and shoulder. He dropped the grenade. He was too wounded to throw the grenade away. So he just pulled it underneath himself and covered it with his own body so that none of the Marines around him were injured by his grenade. He received the Medal of Honor to remember his heroism in the early minutes of this landing at Incheon, and we're remembering his valor with our diorama.
There was no definite enemy defense line on the road to Seoul, but small communist pockets of resistance had to be cleaned out. Elements of the 1st and 5th Marine regiments cleared the rice paddies near the village of Akia. Meanwhile, far to the south, the 8th Army, led by Lieutenant General Walton H. Walker, broke out of the Busan perimeter as communist troops were cut off from supplies and reinforcements by the 10th Corps. The Reds in South Korea were in full retreat, and one of the major objectives of the Incheon invasion had been achieved. The North Korean withdrawal became a rout. The entire North Korean army fled back north of the 38th parallel. We're now 90 days into the Korean War. Our mission was to restore the border at the 38th parallel. The war could have, and with hindsight, should have been over at that point. General MacArthur seeks permission to now change our goals in the Korean War, and instead of just repel aggression, and vindicate self-determination for the South Koreans, MacArthur wants to invade the North. Mao Zedong sends word to the United States that if any Americans cross north of the 38th parallel, China's going to enter the war and go to war with the United States. We received that message through the Indian ambassador and dismissed it as a bluff. MacArthur assured Truman the Chinese would not be foolish enough to take us on in Korea for two reasons. One is they have a no technology infantry only army. They didn't even have radios. They communicate with bugles. They didn't have any trucks to transport supplies or troops. They didn't have a viable air force. They didn't have significant artillery. They didn't have a naval presence. They won't take on the combined arms of the United States military. And if by any chance they do, we will quickly defeat them. MacArthur's arguments carry the day and he is authorized to invade the North. The events in North Korea after we cross the 38th parallel are a tale of two campaigns because of a geographic feature. There's a mountain chain that runs the length of the peninsula in Northern Korea. And that mountain chain was formidable enough that our troops to the west of that mountain chain could not interact with our troops to the east of that mountain chain. On the west side of that mountain chain, Walker's 8th Army gets all the way up to the Chinese border and then they are enveloped and forced to retreat by an overwhelming number of Chinese military. This retreat was at the time and still is today the longest retreat in American history. We retreated from the Chinese border all the way down to the 38th parallel and kept retreating. We gave up Seoul. We retreated south of Seoul before we uh, had uh, outrun the ability of the Chinese to supply themselves to continue to chase us. On the east side of that mountain chain, near the Chinese border is a man-made reservoir called the Chosen Reservoir. The American forces consist of the 1st Marine Division and the Army's 7th Infantry Division. They don't think there's any enemy there. MacArthur's telling them just hurry up. So the American force divides itself in two, sending the Marines around the west coast of that reservoir and the army around the east coast of that reservoir. The army on the east side of the reservoir is enveloped and literally annihilated by the Chinese. Those troops suffer 95% casualties, they lose all of their equipment, they lose all of their wounded. The few survivors escaped by fleeing across the frozen surface of the Chosen Reservoir. This leaves just the 1st Marine Division facing three Chinese armies, outnumbered 10 to 1. To talk about what happened to the 1st Marine Division in this trap, at the Chosen Reservoir, let's move further into the gallery to our vignette about the Marine heroism in the fighting at the Frozen Chosen. We're in the mountains. 
deep snow. The wind consistently blows very strongly, funneled through the mountain passes. At night, the true temperature is as low as 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, as low as 90 degrees below zero with the wind chill. The Marines have summer gear. They are facing 200,000 combat hardened Chinese. The American 8th Army is gone. The elements of the American 7th Infantry Division have been wiped out. The Chinese aren't concerned that the Marines might continue to advance. The Chinese are concerned that the Marines might escape. Mao orders these Chinese soldiers to just wipe out, annihilate to the last man, the entire 1st Marine Division. The Air Force offers to save the members of the 1st Marine Division by evacuating them from this trap with air transport. The problem with that is if the Marines evacuate by air, they're gonna to have to leave all their equipment behind. The Marine commander of the 1st Marine Division, General Smith said, hell no, we're not leaving our equipment behind. We need that to fight. They're already outnumbered if they weaken their strength, flying some members out. Eventually, the members waiting for the next flight are gonna get annihilated and that wasn't acceptable either. So General Smith said, we're gonna to stay together. We're gonna to keep our equipment. We're gonna transport our wounded. We're all gonna fight our way out of this or we're gonna die trying. Chesty Puller was the commanding officer of the 1st Regiment of the 1st Marine Division. Chesty Puller insisted till the day he died that the Marines never retreated from Chosen. Chesty Puller said, there's more enemy behind us than there was in front. So we just turned around and attacked to the rear where most of the enemy was. There are lots of true stories of heroism, valor, sacrifice of the Marines fighting their way out of this trap at the Chosen Reservoir. But for purposes of what we remember in the museum, the Marines successfully overcame all adversity. They fought their way out of that trap. They fought their way across blown bridges. They fought their way through ambush after ambush. They kept all their equipment with them. They kept every single one of their casualties with them until they fought their way south beyond the ability of the Chinese to continue to chase them. The Marines then evacuated by ship, returned to South Korea, fought the remainder of the Korean War. This story of heroism of the Marines at the Chosen Reservoir have become part of the legend, not only of the United States Marines, but of the United States military. One of our proudest chapters, when the new recruits joined the Marine Corps, everybody learns the story of the 1st Marine Division's fighting retreat from the Chosen Reservoir. Everybody learns of the outstanding leadership of Chesty Puller. These set examples that all Marines and all Americans strive to match in their own service on behalf of the United States. Our fighting retreat from the Chosen Reservoir marked the end of American efforts to force North Korea to come under the government of the South. Now let's go into the next part of our gallery and talk about what happened in the Korean War after the conclusion of the American invasion of the North. Here in the last diorama of our Korean War gallery, where we talk about the last and longest phase of the Korean War, the, the time of this last phase really begins January 1951. The war has been going on now for six months. We have uh, retreated from the north. We are south of Seoul, about 20 or 30 miles south of Seoul. We've been able to stop our retreat because the Chinese outran their supply line and could not continue to pursue us. This gives us a chance to stop, regroup, and decide what to do next. There are three options on the table. General MacArthur advances two options to President Truman. The first option is to evacuate the Korean Peninsula with the idea that there is just no stopping the Chinese with conventional war. The second option is we need to go into all-out war against the Chinese. We need to use nuclear weapons. We need to create a, a nuclear radiation buffer at the border between 
uh, China and North Korea, uh, basically risking not only World War III, but a nuclear World War III. Truman rejects MacArthur's advice. President Truman replaced General MacArthur with General Ridgway. General Ridgway was optimistic that we could counterattack the Chinese using only conventional warfare. So beginning in the first half of 1951, General Ridgway reorganized the American-led United Nations forces and counterattacked the Chinese. The counterattack resulted in our retaking of the city of Seoul. We continued to counterattack until we reestablished the border at the 38th parallel. And at that point, Truman orders the American-led United Nations force to now hold the line roughly at the 38th parallel, right where we were several months ago after fighting our way out of the Pusan perimeter. The next two years are a stalemate. The Chinese try some further offensive action. Many of the most famous uh, battles of the Korean War took place during this two to two and a half years of stalemate. The Battle of Pork Chop Hill, the Battle of Heartbreak Ridge, the Battle of the Punch Bowl. In the first half of 1953, Stalin dies. Stalin's death changes the dynamics and the conditions are created where in July of 1953, we're able to negotiate a ceasefire with the Communist Chinese and North Koreans at Panmunjom, bringing the major combat of the Korean War to a close. I say major combat to acknowledge that the North Koreans, South Koreans, Communist Chinese, Americans never signed a peace treaty resolving the border between North and South Korea. We just agreed to stop shooting at each other, that ceasefire. Ever since, right up until May of 2020, when we were finalizing our diorama here about the Korea War, there's continued to be some sporadic fighting across the 38th parallel between North and South Korea. So if we were now to summarize the Korean War, when I think about it, this is my editorial comment, but when I think about the Korean War, I think about two halves of the war. The first half, is the North Korean part of the Korean War where they're trying to take over the South. When we intervened, we clearly beat the North Koreans. We pushed them back, we kept them from taking over the South. We vindicated the South Korean right of self-determination. Hindsight shows how valuable our intervention in the Korean War was as you look today at the standard of living, level of freedom, quality of life of South Korea versus North Korea. If we had not intervened in the Korean War, the South would look like the North today. The second part of the Korean War, I'm not so sure it would be accurate to say that we won. The second part of the Korean War, we decided to invade the North. Our mission became to force the North to come under the government of the South, and we failed in that mission. The Chinese beat us. They kept us from accomplishing that goal. And so that part of the Korean War, I'd say, again, editorial comment, I think the Chinese beat us. And then we ended with stalemate. One of our major lessons learned from the Korean War is that the Chinese were not bluffing when they told us they would go to war with us if we crossed the 38th parallel, entered North Korea, and approach the Chinese border. If you look at the casualties of the Korean War, the United States suffered just under 34,000 Americans killed in action. The Communist Chinese, along with the North Koreans, but primarily the Communist Chinese, lost 1.5 million killed in action. Mao was happy with that trade-off. Mao considered that 1.5 million lives to be well spent for the Chinese leadership to stand down the United States and to prevent us from unifying the Korean Peninsula. The reason this is so critical, such an important lesson learned is 
It colored our decision making during the Vietnam War. And it's something that a lot of American Vietnam War veterans don't know. They don't have that background. A lot of American Vietnam War veterans will complain that the United States government didn't let them win. And that if they had been permitted to invade North Vietnam and to take over Hanoi, they could have accomplished all of that from a military perspective. And I don't doubt that that's true, but the missing piece is the Chinese have a red line. They're not gonna let us approach their border any more than we would let the Chinese approach our border at the Rio Grande. So during the Vietnam War, if we were to approach the Chinese border, it would uh, likely induce the Chinese to directly intervene in the Vietnam War, just like they intervened in the Korean War. And that was an unacceptable uh, risk for the United States. So that really uh, concludes the main points that we offer here about the Korean War. And with that, I'd like to invite all of you to join me to enter in, spend the rest of our time talking about the American experience in the Vietnam War. Here we are at the entrance to the Vietnam War Gallery. And this is a very special part of the museum to me for a lot of different reasons. One is a lot of the Americans who served in Vietnam are still alive today. This is a little bit different from the Korean War experience and the World War II experience. We still have veterans from World War II in the Korean War, but we have a lot of veterans from the Vietnam War. And so we're talking about people's living history today. Another reason that the Vietnam War exhibit and display in our discussion is so special to me is we have not treated our Vietnam War veterans with the honor and appreciation and respect they deserve by and large. When Americans came back from their service in Vietnam, uh, they were in a lot of respects uh, really abused and harassed because of the controversy of the war itself, having nothing to do with their particular valor experiences and stories. And this part of our museum is our effort to make up some ground with Americans who served in Vietnam and to, uh, to really try to make things right to the best of our ability, as well as to make sure that the uh, experiences they had and the service and sacrifice that they had in Vietnam are remembered, passed along to next generations, passed along to Americans today who grew up after the Vietnam War experience. A starting point would be Vietnam was part of a French colony, part of the French Empire, French Indochina. During World War II, the Japanese invaded French Indochina, took it over, took over Vietnam, kicked the French out. During World War II, the nationalist leader of Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, was an American ally. When World War II ended and the Japanese left Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh declared on behalf of the Vietnamese people, he declared the independence of Vietnam uh, in line with our championing of the right of self-determination. This led to the first Indochina War. The first Indochina War combat between the Vietnamese and the French lasted until 1954. In 1954, following a resounding defeat of the French forces at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the French found that the cost and sacrifice of attempting to force the Vietnamese to become again a French colony wasn't worth it. The French negotiated uh, in a Geneva Peace Accord in 1954 with the Vietnamese that the French would leave Vietnam and that two years after the negotiation of this peace treaty, the Vietnamese would hold national elections to have the Vietnamese people decide for themselves how did they want to be governed going forward. So these free and fair national elections were to take place in 1956. The United States does not permit these national elections to take place because it was clear to us that if the Vietnamese people voted for how they wanted to be governed going forward, they were gonna elect Ho Chi Minh and the Communist Party, and that was not okay with us. So this is a bit of, uh, I'm offering my own personal opinion here, but this then is a bit of a black eye on the United States where 
we're saying that we support the right for self-determination, but not self-determination if your self-determination will result in a communist government. So instead of seeing this as a nationalist independence movement, we begin to view the affairs in Vietnam as part of the Cold War, part of the global competition between democracy and communism. The geopolitics have nothing to do with the valor and sacrifice of Americans who served in Vietnam. So now how did we actually get troops on the ground in Vietnam? We block the elections in 1956. We support the election that brought uh, President Diem in as the head of the South Vietnamese government. He was a minority Catholic in a majority Buddhist country. We helped him become the president with, it was either 90 or 95% of the vote after 1956, we've got Ho Chi Minh and his Communist Party ruling the North. We've got President Diem in a uh, so-called republic ruling the South. Really, both governments behave pretty poorly. In the North, the Communist Party assassinated, uh, eliminated political opponents. They re-educated members of their population. They consolidated control over the course of this first five years. And similarly in the South, President Diem assassinated, discriminated against, eliminated his political op opposition. Really, they were twin tyrannies, one tyrant in the North, one tyrant in the South, with us supporting the tyrant in the South. After that first five years from 56 to maybe 1960 or 1961, things entered a new phase. In the North, the Communist Party had consolidated control, which was their priority number one, so now the next thing was, what's priority number two? There was a discussion in the North Vietnamese leadership, either they devote their energies to uh, improving the welfare of the Vietnamese in the North, or they prioritize their efforts to try to reunite the Vietnamese and bring the South Vietnamese under the government of the North. The North Vietnamese leadership decided on that latter course. They decided that their priority was to reunify Vietnam. In the South, uh, President Diem and his South Vietnamese forces were able to counter the guerrilla warfare of the Viet Cong. As the 1960s progressed, the North Vietnamese, in line with their determination that they were gonna exert their force to reunify Vietnam, the North Vietnamese began to send regular North Vietnamese army troops into South Vietnam to join the local South Vietnamese Viet Cong guerrillas in opposing the South Vietnamese government. And as 1965 rolled around, it had become clear to the United States that the North Vietnamese were going to overcome the South Vietnamese government if the South Vietnamese government continued to carry the war on its own with limited support from the United States. And so in 1965, President Johnson sent in ground troops to Vietnam, originally to defend our air assets at the Da Nang airfield. And then uh, from there, from that camel's nose under the tent, we sent more and more ground troops into Vietnam, really taking over the fighting in Vietnam against the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. So that's how we got there. But what we're really gonna focus on is not the politics. What we're gonna focus on is the American experience. A lot of the Americans serving in Vietnam are only 19 years old. What did these 19 year olds go through? How did they acquit themselves in extremely di difficult conditions of service? With that, please join me. Let's go into the gallery and start talking about the stories of the American experience in Vietnam. The first diorama in our Vietnam War gallery discusses the role of helicopters in the Vietnam War. Helicopters were used so pervasively throughout Vietnam that the war itself is sometimes referred to as the helicopter war. One of the reasons that helicopters were so useful in the Vietnam War was because there were no front lines. So we didn't know 
whether we were going to have to move forward, backward, to one side in order to engage the enemy. The helicopter also was particularly well suited to transport American combat troops in an environment where there were very few roads. We could appear at any point in the jungle without advance notice, having a whole platoon of helicopters just appear out of the sky. Another major role of helicopters in the Vietnam War was medical evacuation. The speed with which wounded Americans could be taken out of the battlefield and brought to a field hospital was absolutely unprecedented. Often a wounded American would be in a field hospital within 30 to 40 minutes of being wounded. A lot of American lives were saved by uh, helicopter medevacs. Another use of the helicopter was to provide air support of troops on the ground. Helicopters could be armed with rockets, with machine guns, and fire on the enemy from in the air. A fourth role of the helicopter was to help transport supplies. Most supplies were transported by trucks or by tracked vehicles on the ground, but helicopters had a, a key supplemental role to play in keeping American troops well supplied in Vietnam. Helicopters were also used as reconnaissance, so it was just a very versatile tool used by lots of Americans in, in Vietnam. This particular helicopter has a famous battle history. It was deployed to Vietnam initially with the 101st Airborne Division, then with the Army's 1st Cavalry Division. When the 1st Cavalry Division received later model, new and improved Huey helicopters, this helicopter was transferred to the only Navy helicopter squadron serving in Vietnam, the Sea Wolves. This uh, particular helicopter has signs of battle damage on it. It's the real deal. It was in Vietnam in combat for a number of years. It was returned to the United States and then flown as a tribute helicopter by a Sea Wolves veteran for a number of years until he made it available to me to preserve forever here in our museum. Along with interpretation of the use of the helicopter and the role of the helicopter, the impact the helicopter had, we have other airborne related vehicles here in this diorama. The first thing that we have is kind of a compact version of what looks like a Jeep. It's not officially a Jeep. It's a special manufactured M422 Mighty Might, very compact so that it can be transported in a helicopter used only by the Marines for a limited period of time in Vietnam. The next vehicle we have down the row here is one of our few Air Force trucks. This particular Air Force truck is an R2 crash rescue vehicle. Anytime we have airborne operations, we're going to have crash landings, either because of mechanical failures or because of combat damage. And if we have crash landings where Americans are caught in the wreckage, we want the capability to go in, even if we're going into the fire in fire suits, we want the capability to go into that wreckage and save the life of any Americans possible. The next uh, vehicle in this diorama is a very rare Hawk anti-aircraft missile system. These were deployed in Vietnam, beginning with the introduction of ground troops in 1965 until 1968. The reason for it is our first ground troops were focused on protecting our air assets at the Da Nang airfield. Now, as it turned out, we never fired Hawk missile systems in Vietnam, but we did deploy them for that three-year period. They're very rare. I don't know if you'll see another uh, fully restored Hawk anti-aircraft missile system other than in our museum. The last vehicle we have in this row of uh, air-themed air uh, vehicles is our M56 Scorpion anti-tank gun. In Vietnam, we do not often combat against enemy tanks. This anti-tank gun then was very effective shooting at enemy bunkers. In order to make this air transportable, air droppable, the chassis supporting the gun is very light. It was a mismatch, such a light chassis, such a powerful gun. When the gun was fired, the whole vehicle would go up in the air. 
the M56 Scorpion, after a limited period of use with the 173rd Airborne in Vietnam, was uh, taken out of service and replaced by the M551 Sheridan light tank. So that's, uh, we're, we're paying homage to uh, some of the uh, specialized air capable uh, vehicles that served in Vietnam alongside our, our helicopters. The next vignette in our Vietnam War gallery pays special tribute to the American women who volunteered for military service in Vietnam. Today, when we talk about the role of American women in military service, I'm reminded of the quotation from the first female four-star general officer, Ann Dunwoody. General Dunwoody says, today, women are in combat just like men. That's just the reality. They're dying and being decorated for valor in combat. Today, the military no longer is a band of brothers. Today, the military is a band of brothers and sisters. In the Vietnam War, American women who volunteered for military service did not serve in combat roles. They served in a variety of additional support roles, sometimes administrative support, very often they served as nurses, helping to save the lives of wounded Americans. More than 7,400 American women volunteered for military service. In addition to these, approximately another 50,000 American civilian women volunteered to serve in Vietnam. I'd like to particularly focus on the names and faces of the eight American women who lost their lives serving the United States in Vietnam. One cannot help but be touched looking at these American women knowing that their lives were snuffed out so prematurely as a result of their service in Vietnam. In addition to these eight American women, remember that another 58,200 American men with the same life and vitality whose names and faces we are not showing here, similarly lost their lives in Vietnam. This is Saigon. Yesterday, a city of one million. Today, caught up in the cross currents and eddies of conflict, its population swollen to two million. Here, an ever-growing stream of supplies is being swiftly channeled through to ultimate destinations in the inland jungle. For these fighting men, the steady flow of supply can mean life or death, victory or defeat. This is the story behind the drama played around the world. The story of supply. The story of a lifeline. In the Vietnam War, just like in every other war, most of the Americans deployed to the war theater were officially assigned support roles rather than combat roles. Once supplies got into Vietnam, most of those supplies were transported where they needed to be by trucks on roads, just like in every other war. One peculiarity of the Vietnam War is that there weren't all that many roads in Vietnam and Every single day, we'd have these truck convoys going down the same roads. The enemy would know exactly where our convoys were gonna go, and they could choose the time and place where they would engage in combat with these supply trucks. This is before the time of night vision goggles, so the enemy owned the night. They had almost free reign to plant mines in the road, to prepare ambushes. So here we've got 19-year-olds they don't have any choice about picking a different route. They've got to go down the same road. Sometimes they would have security from helicopter gunships. Sometimes they'd have security from M48 patent tanks. Uh, but a common denominator among all of these truck convoys is, by and large, they did not have adequate security. And as they were taking casualties day after day, they, they said to heck with this, and they innovated security for themselves. They created what came to be known as the gun truck.
It was not a standard government issue weapon that the Americans are improvising for themselves to have the best chance of surviving their deployment to Vietnam. So they take a cargo truck that would create some kind of protection in the bed of the cargo truck. They might have armor, they might have sandbags, they might have other material that they would use to create some protection against gunfire. And then they would get together as many automatic weapons as they could get their hands on. For example, our gun truck has a variety of automatic weapons mounted on it. On the front is a very rare minigun. Miniguns are usually mounted on helicopters or other aircraft. They're not mounted on ground vehicles, but here the troops on the ground have put it right over the cab of the gun truck. The gun truck then has another six 50 caliber machine guns on it. Again, you might find one crew served 50 caliber machine gun, maybe two guns working in conjunction, but you wouldn't see six. This gun truck is just bristling with weapons. The idea was you sprinkled these homemade gun trucks in among the soft-skinned, unprotected cargo trucks, just waiting for the enemy to spring an ambush. When the enemy sprang an ambush, these gun trucks took on the mission of attacking the ambush with all this automatic weapons fire and attempt to break up the ambush, preventing further casualties to the rest of the convoy. If you were a gunner on a gun truck in Vietnam, you had a very short life expectancy. We're remembering and paying tribute to all those Americans who served in these support roles and put themselves in harm's way with this vignette on logistics, on truck convoys, and then with special attention to the innovation of the gun truck. The gun truck we have here in this museum was not actually deployed in Vietnam. Only one such gun truck was returned to the United States. It's currently in the Army Transportation Museum in Fort Eustis in Virginia. Our gun truck is a tribute gun truck. It was uh, created by a Vietnam veteran after he returned to the United States here to remember and honor his service in Vietnam and the service of others like him who served as uh, truck drivers in these convoys and uh, ended up in combat every bit as much as any other American in Vietnam. Each one of these vehicles support a story about American valor, American service and sacrifice. But for now, I'll leave those stories for another day. And I'd like to transition into a discussion of uh, jungle warfare in Vietnam. We do the best we can to put ourselves in the shoes of a 19 year old American serving in Vietnam, confronting the enemy in the jungle. The starting point is to get a good visual on what we're talking about with the jungle. The jungle was so dense, light could not penetrate portions of the jungle. The jungle floor itself would be covered in dead vegetation. You had no way to know what lay underneath that dead vegetation. Was there a booby trap? Was there a mine that was gonna explode as soon as you set your foot there? Is there a pit full of sharpened stakes? And it's not just danger from booby traps and danger from the enemy, it's also danger from the jungle. Malaria was very prevalent in Vietnam. There were extremely poisonous snakes in Vietnam. Bamboo vipers were nicknamed two-step snakes because if you got bit by a bamboo viper, you were dead two steps later. Most of the Americans who served in Vietnam grew up either in a city or in the suburbs. If they were army members, it would be a 12-month deployment. If the Americans were serving in the Marines, it typically would be a 13-month deployment. So can you imagine being a fish out of water against an enemy right at home in his and her backyard, losing friends, losing buddies to every single one of these hazards. There were existing pathways in the jungle, but American troops would not use those existing pathways because it was just too dangerous. Any existing pathways were certain to be booby trapped. They would be very likely sites for enemy ambushes. And for that reason, we stayed off the trails. We patrolled the jungle by walking through so-called virgin jungle. 
That meant that we had to have a couple of 19 year olds in front of the rest of the unit with machetes, literally cutting their way through the bamboo for each step. It might be 130 degrees, it might be very high humidity, extremely exhausting to hack through this dense jungle with machetes. The young Americans in front would cut until they collapsed, they'd fall back and rest and rehydrate, and a couple other Americans would come up and take their place to hack through the jungle. We've created our own version of a jungle environment. We have a jungle trail, and what we offer to everyone is, please put yourselves in the shoes. Imagine you're 19 years old, and now walk along this jungle trail and see how that feels and what kind of environment that is, what level of stress you might imagine. One of the first things that we offer to you is a tunnel complex showing a Viet Cong soldier lifting a concealed cover from a tunnel entrance. The tunnel is defended by a variety of booby traps, trip wires down below, trip wires up above, we're depicting a particular kind of booby trap called a bouncing Betty mine. You just see three little prongs sticking up out of the dirt. Now that's if there isn't dead vegetation covering those prongs. As soon as you step on that, that mine is going to bounce up in the air. It's going to explode in the air. That's where the name bouncing Betty came from. That mine might kill you. It might take off your foot. It might take off your leg. And any time any member of the patrol suffers any kind of casualty, the whole American unit has to stop and they've got to call in an evacuation helicopter, letting everybody in the surrounding jungle know just exactly where that American unit is patrolling in the jungle. And so the enemy gets just a lot of value. There's psychological impact on the American unit, frustration, not seeing an enemy, just being worn down by these booby traps. Uh, there's all of the delay of, involved with casualties and the loss of American lives and limbs from these casualties as well. As we come out of the jungle trail, you see an American artillery fire support base start to emerge through the blur of the jungle. Let's go into the fire support base and talk about the role of American artillery fire support bases in the war in Vietnam. To talk about the role and significance of an American artillery fire support base, bring back to mind Americans with machetes hacking their way through thick bamboo. What sense does it make to have Americans hack through the jungle, not surprising anyone. Day after day, we keep running into booby traps. In a lot of these situations, the only time we would find the enemy is when the enemy wanted to be found. That means that the enemy has laid an ambush for us. They've picked the terrain, they've picked the time of day, They've gathered a force that they find to give them an advantage in choosing to fight us. Now that starts out sounding a little bit like a suicide mission. Just what's the sense of it? Why are we putting Americans in harm's way like that? The method to the madness is, on the one hand, Americans are bait for the enemy. On the other hand, the Americans patrolling are trying to lure the enemy into gathering a significant force to ambush us. Because when the enemy springs that ambush, we're patrolling in an area that is within range of an artillery fire support base. What we're banking on is being able to radio immediately and accurately for artillery fire support. Now we're trying to turn the tables on the enemy. So they have gathered a lot of enemy together to try to overrun our patrol. And that's a wonderful artillery target. A lot of enemy together. It's like a game of cat and mouse. Sometimes we're the mouse, sometimes we're the cat. Just extremely hazardous patrolling through the jungle day after day, 
in coordination with the strategic placement and our reliance on the availability and alertness and accuracy of an artillery fire support base. So this artillery fire support base has the elements that are typical of artillery fire support bases in Vietnam. First and foremost is the artillery pieces. Now in our model fire base, we have only one artillery piece, an M109, or 155 millimeter self-propelled howitzer. If this was a real fire support base, we'd have a lot of additional artillery pieces here. In the case of an M109 self-propelled howitzer, we would typically pair that with an M548 tracked amphibious ammunition carrier. Another typical component of an artillery fire support base would be the artillery command center, officially referred to as a fire direction center. The artillery specialists in that fire direction center are gonna plot out a fire mission as fast as they can and it has to be accurate and they're gonna now communicate that fire mission to the guns that are sitting elsewhere in the fire support base. If we're going to put American artillery right in the middle of enemy territory, we're gonna have to defend it with infantry to keep the enemy from capturing our artillery. As you came into the entrance of the fire base, you saw three 50-gallon barrels buried in the dirt. These 50-gallon barrels are called food gas barrels. They're full of napalm. Each barrel has a Claymore mine at the bottom of the barrel, and the force of the mine would then spread that flaming napalm all over the enemy trying to attack. So it's tactic and counter-tactic. Uh, you see here firing positions that are cut into the perimeter, reinforced with sandbags. Any forward base carved out of the jungle in the middle of enemy territory typically would have some kind of guard tower. And here again, this is hazardous duty. The value of a guard tower is you have a 360 degree field of observation, but on the other hand, that guard tower is sticking up like a sore thumb. It's the obvious first target for the enemy. Elsewhere here in this fire base, you see some of the human touches. We show the tactical operations center, which would be the infantry command post, typically pretty crude. It might just be a sandbag tent. You also see how tough these living conditions were. Here we have uh, sleeping quarters, just ponchos that are connected together in a lean-to. You also see kind of tongue-in-cheek, call it a drinking fountain. It's what's called a lister bag, a canvas bag held up by a tripod full of water. That's what you have to drink. That's what you have to fill your canteens. As we uh, come to the end of our fire support base, we're showing an example of an improved hooch. The fire base was there long enough the Americans might improve their sleeping quarters with sandbag positions, with lumber, with other material. And that's the best it got. That's how you were living if you were deployed to an artillery fire support base or some other forward operating base in Vietnam. All along the 1,500 miles of South Vietnam's coastline and in the endless waterways of the Mekong River Delta, nine million acres of fertile wet rice paddies and farmlands. The only practical means of transportation for farmer and businessman, fisherman and tourist, government loyalist and Viet Cong is by water. Uncontrolled, this normal activity provides the VC with a continuing opportunity for smuggling and infiltration. It is clear to American naval observers early in the war that an essential step in denying this most populous area of South Vietnam to the Viet Cong would be the development of patrol craft suited to the task of controlling these lanes of transportation and communication. The Mekong River runs through a number of countries in Southeast Asia and empties into the sea just outside Saigon, which at the time was the capital city of South Vietnam. If we left the Mekong Delta as a safe haven for the enemy, that would have given the enemy control of about 60% of the agricultural production of the country and control of about 30% of the population. That control would have included taxing the population to support the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese war effort. So it was critical for the United States to engage the enemy in the Mekong Delta. Vietnam, marked the first time the United States military 
found itself in combat on rivers since the American Civil War 100 years earlier. The part of the Navy that fought in the Mekong Delta came to be known as the Brownwater Navy. The sailors who served in the Brownwater Navy often called themselves river rats. A typical mission of the Brownwater Navy was to patrol the waterways and work to interdict enemy infiltration efforts. They would stop boats along the way, search the boats, see if there were military supplies in the boat, see if there were enemy soldiers that were hidden as part of the boat. The river boats would work in coordination with combat teams that were patrolling on foot. Ground forces would often be pursuing enemy forces. The enemy would come to a waterway. PBRs would attack the enemy trying to cross through that waterway. Combat on a river boat was very different from combat on land. As the river rats tell us in their oral histories, once the fire broke out, there was no place to hide. You couldn't get in a foxhole, you just had to remain on the deck. The boats were not armored. The only protection you had was to try to gain fire superiority over the enemy force using all of the weapons of the PBR at your disposal. The casualty rate of American serving on PBRs was very high throughout the Vietnam War, but the PBR squadrons were extremely successful. By 1969, the Brownwater Navy really had gained superiority over the enemy in the Mekong Delta and was then uh, prepared to turn over Mekong Delta responsibilities to the South Vietnamese Navy. We leave the Mekong Delta and find ourselves almost immediately back in the United States in a living room in the late 1960s. Imagine the experience for a 20-year-old who has been immersed in the Vietnam War environment for an extended period and has gone through that daily stress, that daily hazard, who has seen with his and to an extent her own eyes all of the horrors and tragedies of war. Imagine them having that ingrained in them by the end of their deployment. Imagine the level of trauma that so many young Americans would have gone through, the traumatic experiences that are now part of their DNA that will remain with them for the rest of their lives. Imagine them coming directly out of that combat experience, maybe being picked up in that forward operating base by a helicopter right out of combat, transported to an air base, getting into a Freedom Bird, a fixed wing aircraft, and flying directly back to the United States, they're still in their uniform. They have no transition from their combat deployment. They have no support system. They're just brought to the San Francisco or the Denver airport. They are let off the airplane and they are just thrown right back into civilian life just that abruptly. It might be only 24 hours after leaving Vietnam, might be 48 hours after leaving combat, and they're right back thrust into civilian life, just like would be shown here coming from the immersion of our Vietnam War gallery into a 1960s American living room. One goal of this diorama is to remember that this is the first war where combat was covered live and uncensored by television and other media and then communicated directly back to the American public. And this had a huge impact on American public opinion. In uh, World War II and in other wars, there was censorship. The American public was sheltered from a lot of the key horrors of the war. In the Vietnam War, however, the American public saw the war unadulterated the way it really was. One way that we measured success in the Vietnam War was with what was called body count. And in 1967, the message from the political and military leadership to the American public was that enemy body count was so high that from that point on, enemy strength would decline. Instead of seeing the war become easier and easier, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong launched a surprise and thoroughly coordinated attack across 70 towns and cities 
stretching from the northern part of South Vietnam down to the capital city of Saigon with what came to be known as the 1968 Tet Offensive. Then came the Vietnamese New Year, Tet. The enemy chose this occasion to unleash well-coordinated attacks in several areas of the Republic. Striking treacherously where least expected, the Viet Cong brought the war to the cities of South Vietnam. Gunfire roared in the streets and panic spread throughout the population. So here we are all at home in 1968, and instead of watching the situation become more favorable to our interests in Vietnam, we're watching the United States military doing its best to take back the American embassy that's been captured by enemy forces. The disconnect between what our leadership told us we could expect to see and what we actually did see in 1968 cost American political and military leadership a significant amount of its credibility. So that's the significance of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong 1968 Tet Offensive. It marked the psychological turning point in the war from the perspective of the American public. Prior to the 68 Tet Offensive, a portion of the American population opposed the war in Vietnam. After the 68 Tet Offensive, a larger and larger percent of the American public came to oppose the American involvement in the war in Vietnam. The battle for the city of Hue marked the first urban combat for the United States military since the Korean War. It also marked the first time that the North Vietnamese brought the war directly into a major city. The city itself was the former imperial capital of Vietnam. The old part of the city had wonderful stone architecture. The fighting began on the second day of the Tet holiday, January 31, 1968, and lasted until the first part of March of 1968. We began the battle thinking that the city was only lightly defended by the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, but it turned out that this fighting became as fierce urban combat as any fighting in the Korean War or in World War II. It was door-to-door -door fighting, building-to-building -building fighting, one of the longest and bloodiest battles of the entire Vietnam War for the United States military. The stone buildings in the old part of the city of Hue offered excellent protection for the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. At places, the walls were as thick as 20 feet. We start out trying to save the city itself and drive out the enemy. We're taking too many casualties. We had to change tactics, bringing in American Air Force to bomb the defensive positions, bringing in M48 battle tanks. We brought in the M50 Antos with six 106 millimeter recoilless rifles to blast through the walls of the city of Hue. The enemy put a flag on the top of a tower in the heart of the old part of the city, the citadel of the city of Hue, and uh, that tower fell last. You see our depiction in this diorama. We have an archway that was part of the tower complex where the final fighting took place and we were finally able to take down the enemy flag that had been flown for a full month during enemy occupation of the city. During the fighting, we suffered 1,800 American casualties. The South Vietnamese military suffered a greater number of casualties. Thousands of civilians were killed. The fighting destroyed a full 80% of the city by the time it was over, early March of 1968. The tank you see next to me is an M48 Patton tank. Uh, we use these extensively during the combat in Way. We called on a very unique weapon, an M50 Antos, that was originally designed as an anti-tank gun, but in the battle for the city of Way, 
really became a prime weapon to help the United States Marines punch holes through 20 foot thick walls, through other buildings to facilitate the Marines clearing the city of the enemy in heavily fortified positions. One reason that we remember the city of Way in our Vietnam War gallery is we want to put this in the context of think of all of the other fighting environments young Americans found themselves in. A lot of the Americans who were deployed to Vietnam were draftees. They have minimal training. There's a limited time they're going to be part of the military. They prepare for one kind of fighting environment, a typical fighting environment in Vietnam. And here in Way now, they find themselves in an entirely different situation than what they've trained for. We were so unprepared for the kind of urban combat we found ourselves in in the city of Way that one of the Marine Battalion commanders had to dig up an old field manual to refresh himself on what Marine Corps tactics were for engaging in urban warfare. So the, the leadership was not tuned in, the troops certainly were not tuned in, and here we were in the fight of our lives in the longest and bloodiest combat scenario for our entire involvement in Vietnam. During the battle for the city of Hue, one of the most reputable and credible news anchors of his time, Walter Cronkite, came to the battlefield and uh, recorded television coverage reporting to the American public that based on what he saw in the Tet Offensive itself and in the combat in the city of Way, he no longer thought it was possible for the United States to win in Vietnam. The communist intention was to take and seize the cities. They came closer here at Hue than anywhere else. And now, three weeks after the offensive began, the firing still goes on from here on the new side of the city and across the Perfume River to the old side, the Citadel. The destruction here was almost total. There's scarcely an inhabitable building in the city of Hue. Whatever price the communists paid for this offensive, the price to the Allied cause was high. For if our intention is to restore normalcy, peace, serenity to this country, the destruction of those qualities in this the most historical and probably serene of all South Vietnam cities is obviously a setback. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe in the face of the evidence the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To suggest we are on the edge of defeat is to yield to unreasonable pessimism. To say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. On the off chance, the military and political analysts are right. In the next few months, we must test the enemy's intentions in case this is indeed his last big gasp before negotiations. But it is increasingly clear to this reporter that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. This is Walter Cronkite. Good night. As a direct result of the Tet Offensive, President Johnson decided not to stand for re-election later that year. And Richard Nixon became elected president of the United States in November of 1968. Uh, shortly after President Nixon took office, he began to withdraw American troops from Vietnam under a doctrine known as Vietnamization, where the fighting in Vietnam going forward would increasingly be borne by the South Vietnamese military not by the United States military. By January of 1973, the United States, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong signed the Paris Peace Accords whereby we agreed to withdraw all remaining American troops from Vietnam and the enemy agreed to release all American prisoners, bringing the war to a close. What I'd like to do next is just summarize what we've reviewed here during this tour and talk about some of the consequences and takeaways. 
and uh, key messages that we're working to deliver in the Vietnam War Gallery here for all of the visitors to the National Museum of Military Vehicles. First, let's talk about success. From a military perspective, on a military level, the 3,400,000 Americans who were deployed to Vietnam accomplished every major military goal that was set out for them. We were fighting an extremely tough, experienced, capable enemy. The North Vietnamese spent their lives during the Vietnam War fighting the French, fighting the Americans, fighting the South Vietnamese. They were disciplined and effective adversaries. In contrast, the young Americans, who really primarily were civilian soldiers, many draftees, were fish out of water to a very large extent. Minimal training, minimal experience, rapid turnover, being assigned into a unit, being transferred to another unit, fighting in unfamiliar territory. And yet, with all of this going against the Americans who served in Vietnam, we were militarily victorious and we punish the enemy far more than the enemy punished us. As you come through the museum in the battle for the city of Wei, you see a quote from Ho Chi Minh where he boasts that we can kill 10 of his for every one of ours and he'll still win. Well, we didn't kill 10 of his for every one of ours. We killed closer to 20 of his for every one of ours that we lost. We were extremely effective on the battlefield in these challenging conditions. So that's, that's one point is, regardless of the politics, celebrate the military success and effectiveness and valor of the Americans who served. The Americans who served in Vietnam accomplished their victories at very high personal cost. We begin by honoring the 58,200 Americans who fell in Vietnam. Add to that how many Americans returned to the United States but were severely wounded during their service in Vietnam. That was about another 153,000. Add to that the number of Americans who were casualties due to their exposure to Agent Orange. Agent Orange was a defoliant the United States used in Vietnam. Defoliant just means that it killed vegetation. The jungle offered excellent concealment to the enemy. They could travel in the jungle without us being able to see them from the air. They could ambush us alongside roads using the jungle as cover. So one of the strategies that we devised was, well, we'll just take away that cover by spraying defoliant on that part of the jungle. We paid no regard to the fact that that same Agent Orange that was gonna kill vegetation was extremely poisonous to people. And we didn't acknowledge that to the Americans who served in Vietnam. The Americans are exposed to Agent Orange. They return to the United States after their deployment. The Vietnam War is long over. And Vietnam veterans noticed that they were developing cancer. They were dying of cancer. They were developing other diseases at a far higher rate than the general population. For more than 20 years, the United States government, and the, including the VA, including the United States military, the United States denied, we stonewalled, we gaslighted the Americans who served in Vietnam and said that their deaths and that their disabilities and that their birth defects had nothing to do with their military service, had nothing to do with their deployment to Vietnam, had nothing to do with their exposure to Agent Orange. Our research shows that after the United States government came clean and acknowledged that Agent Orange caused the cancers, the birth defects, the other diseases that were associated with exposure to Agent Orange, around 650,000 Vietnam veterans were treated for their exposure to Agent Orange. So add that 650,000 to the more than 200,000 Americans who were killed or wounded. Add to that 850,000 all of the American post-traumatic stress disorder casualties. In 2019, the VA data showed 271,000 Americans who served in Vietnam 
were still suffering from PTSD as a result of their service in Vietnam. That number of 271,000 does not include all of the Americans who returned from their service suffering from PTSD who then passed away before 2019. So the, the number of PTSD casualties is probably closer to 600,000 total casualties. But even if we use this conservative 271,000 still suffering in 2019 and add that to 850,000, we have about 1.1 million Americans who served in Vietnam became casualties during their service. Only 3.4 million Americans served in Vietnam. If we suffered about 1.1 million casualties, that's about a one-third casualty rate. I'm not aware of any American war where we suffered about one-third casualties. So the level of personal sacrifice Americans who served in Vietnam bore is unique, devastating, unprecedented. One would like to say that because of the military success of Americans who served in Vietnam and because they paid such a high price to gain that success, you'd like to say that's why we treat our Vietnam veterans so well. That's why we have been so appreciative of what they did. But the reverse is true. We've treated our Vietnam War veterans worse than we've treated any other group of Americans in United States history. When Americans returned from Vietnam, they were regularly met at the airport by war protesters. Day after day, the war protesters had a script. What they would do is they would go up to these Americans who had just gotten home from their service in combat and spit in their face, call them baby killers again and again. It was so prevalent and so bad that Americans returning from Vietnam were warned, change into civilian clothes before you go out into the terminal because you're gonna just be terribly abused if you appear in your uniform. It was the worst possible reception, the worst possible lack of appreciation. No welcome home, no thank you. Now think about the quote from George Washington that's on our wall of reflection outside the museum. George Washington says to the effect, the willingness of young people to serve in future wars, no matter how justified, will be in direct proportion to how they perceive the government has treated and appreciated its veterans. It's a wonder that after the way we mistreated and gaslighted and failed to support Vietnam veterans that any Americans have been willing to serve on behalf of the United States since then. It is one of the worst chapters in the history of American freedom. Never again, we can never again treat American veterans the way we've treated our Vietnam War veterans. A major mission of this museum is to do our small part to welcome home every American who served in Vietnam, to thank every American who served in Vietnam, to spread the stories of all those Americans who served in Vietnam to other people so that all of us get an opportunity to do our small part to make things right. Vietnam veterans were not appreciated when they returned home. Well, they're still alive. A lot of them are still alive and direct families of veterans who have passed are still alive and know what those veterans went through. It's not too late for us here at the museum and it's not too late for everybody who comes through this museum to say thank you and welcome home Vietnam veterans. Your stories, valor and sacrifice will be remembered forever by all who visit this museum.